Well, good morning and welcome. My name is Chuck Wilson, and I am still the pastor at Bethel Church in Wallaceburg, Ontario. I don't know about you, but this is getting kind of old to me, getting tired of preaching to that little green dot on my computer, trusting that uh, you're praying, as I am, that the doors will open again soon and that we'll be able to meet together in person. But until then, well, hope you're keeping connected to folks, and we'll do our best to uh, give you something to chew on, spiritually speaking, during the course of the week. Just before we head into our worship, let's pray. Well, Lord, we come to you this morning and we ask again for your blessing and for your favor, uh, praying that you would use these words and thoughts to encourage your people, watch over them, bless them, keep them safe, we pray, and we commit all that's said and done into your hands, be honored by it, we pray. And we do ask these things in the good name of our Lord and Savior. We ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like my 
fall before your feet, you are my king. I'm living for the beauty of your presence, to behold the glory of your face. If you were with us last week, you may remember that we were looking at Mark chapter 2, the first 12 verses. In that passage, we were challenged by the example of four men who were desperate to get their friend to Jesus. We were really forced to consider how passionate that we are to do likewise. But so often, it seems to me that while we have the emotion We really lack the know-how as to what to do, how to channel this passion in a way that's effective. Well, thankfully, that chapter goes on to tell us. This morning, we're looking at Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 17. But let me begin with this. Back in 1929, the UCLA Bruins were playing Georgia Tech in the Rose Bowl when a young man named Roy Regals picked up a fumble and started to rumble toward the end zone. The unfortunate thing was that he was headed for his own end zone. Well, he was thankful that one of his teammates caught up with him 65 yards later and tackled him just before he scored for the opposing team. Unfortunately, Georgia Tech did score just a few plays later, and as you would imagine, that demoralized his team. And it demoralized Roy, perhaps more than anyone else. Shortly thereafter, halftime came, and he and his teammates filed into their dressing room. I'm told that normally at halftime in a game like this, the coach has a lot to say, but On this occasion, Coach Price was dumbfounded. 
He had no idea how to comfort his team, and even what to say to Roy. In fact, it wasn't until three minutes before the second half began that he said, well, men, the same team that started the first half will start the second. And with that, the UCLA Bruins stood up and headed back for the field. All of the team, that is, except Roy Regals. The coach looked back and saw him still sitting in a corner with his head covered. And he said, Regals, what are you doing? Didn't you hear me? But Regals, again, didn't answer. And so Coach Price went over to him, and he put a hand on his shoulder, and he said, Roy, the same team that started the first half will start the second. Well, Roy looked up at his coach, tears streaming down his cheeks, and said, Coach, I just, I can't do it. I've embarrassed you. I've, I've embarrassed the university. I've embarrassed my team. I, I can't go out there and face those fans. Well, coach wasn't sure exactly what to say, but I think with a touch of divine wisdom ultimately said, Roy, get up and go on back. The game is only half over. And Roy Regals did just that. He got up, he rejoined his teammates, and he played hard the rest of that game. Well, you know, as I read that story, I was reminded of the one that we find in this chapter, Mark chapter 2. I've entitled this message, Keeping the Right Company. It's the story of a man who really got a second chance and who determined to make the most of it. Herein, we learn three things. The first of which is that Jesus calls all kinds of people. Jesus calls all kinds of people, even people just like you. Isn't that great? Verse 13, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake a large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. It occurs to me that so often we read stories like this, and we fail to really uncover the meaning. Let's not be guilty of doing that today. Jesus, popularly with the crowds, is evident. It, it seems as though he is teaching the people as he walks along. But on this particular journey, he happens across a man named Levi. Uh, Levi is almost universally identified as Matthew. Uh, Levi may well have been his given name and and Matthew, which means gift of God, that may have been the name that Jesus gave him. We can't really say for sure, though. What's really significant to remember at this point is that Matthew was a tax collector. And, and tax collectors in that day, in that culture, were considered the refuse of society. They were despised by their fellow Jews. They were considered traitors, really, um, like a, a fox amongst the hounds, if you will. See, when a Jew entered the custom service, he was regarded as an outcast from society. He was disqualified from serving as a, a witness in a court case or, or as a judge. He was excommunicated from the religious community and in the eyes of all, that disgrace even extended to his immediate family. And so we wonder, why would anyone enter the trade? Well, uh, customs in that day was a little bit different than it is in ours. 
Uh, nowadays, uh, we pay someone to collect duty on behalf of the government, but it was the Roman practice to lease the customs office of a district at a fixed price. And, and so people would bid on the right to collect taxes for a, a specific area. And whatever came in above and beyond that amount was yours to keep. And so we can well imagine how easy and how commonplace it was for these officials to cheat the people and to become exceedingly wealthy in the process. Being a tax collector made Matthew just about as much of an outcast as a leper would have been. Now, I have a niece. In fact, I have two nieces who work for Revenue Canada down through the years, but I know they did not become the outcasts of the family. Years ago, one was in charge of a section of auditors who were sent out to large companies to examine their books for uh, what you might call irregularities. I once asked her how people received her when he showed up at their office to see their books, and she said they were always very polite, always very helpful, but she did add she wondered what they said about her when her back was turned or when she left their office. You see, tax collectors in any day are, are not the most popular group. In many cases, they're considered, well, a little bit shifty in most people's eyes. And friends, that is really what's so striking about Jesus' call. To this despised man, to the guy that everybody loved to hate, Jesus said, come, follow me. He says it to the Tanya Hardings of the world, who's so desperate to win at figure skating that she paid someone to, to break a competitor's leg. He says it to the, the Dennis Rodmans of the world, who, who just seem to get more obnoxious with each passing year. That call goes out to all of the Mike Tysons out there, who don't just box their competitors, but who actually bite them. Do you understand? Friends, it doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't matter what we've done or how we've lived. We can be the baddest of the bad, but Jesus calls out all the same. Come, follow me. I love the simplicity of Mark's record of Matthew's response. It says, and Matthew, Levi, got up and followed him. It's interesting to me that uh, the four who had so recently left all to follow Jesus, they could go back to their nets. I'm sure they could go back to their boats if things didn't pan out with Jesus. But that would not be the way for Levi. This man was making an irrevocable decision. He wasn't going to get this job back if he just up and left it. But somehow, it just didn't seem to matter. What did was that he who had known constant ridicule and rejection found acceptance in the call of Jesus. And friends, the incredible truth is so too can we, when we make the choice to follow him. You see, because Jesus, he calls all kinds of people. That's great news. In fact, not only just does Jesus call them, but Jesus spent time with all kinds of people. That's what the passage goes on to tell us. Verse 15 while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? See, having made the decision 
to follow Jesus. That's clear that Matthew wanted his colleagues to know all about it. And so he he threw himself a, a kind of coming out party. Well, no, perhaps that's a, a poor choice of words. Coming out party is not quite, never mind. What was somewhat surprising about this party is that Matthew invited both religious and irreligious friends to attend. Now, when I consider that, I think he invited intentionally a mixed crowd. I believe that this, in his mind, was to be a party with a purpose, we might say. Now, and if that's true, we've got to give him credit. Matthew had become a follower while pursuing his career as a, a tax collector, but, but his encounter with Jesus clearly had, had radically affected his heart. And as a result, he has this immediate concern for his friends who never had the chance to meet Jesus. His desire was to help them find what he himself had discovered. The only question really was how? I love how Steve Shogren describes it. Levi I hadn't been through any evangelism course. He hadn't attended seminary. He didn't have any gospel tracts. All he had was this changed heart and a determined spirit, and he'd figure the rest out. One strategy certainly was to, to bring his tax-collecting buddies to the temple to, to hear someone more articulate than he to explain the truth to them. But the only option there was this robed rabbi reading from the Old Testament law. Matthew didn't have to think long and hard to, to realize that that approach wasn't going to connect with his high-flying, loose-living friends. I suppose he, he could have given up at this point. I mean, he could have just wrung his hands and said, well, there just really are no good options. I, the robe rabbi is altogether out, and, and I can never count on Jesus and being any one place for too long. Besides, I don't even know if my buddies will go out of their way to hear some guy preaching on a hillside. Maybe, maybe I should just give up. Maybe they'll just fend for themselves like I did. Do you know, it, it occurs to me that there are a lot of Christians who do just that, who, who, who wring their hands and who insulate their hearts from the plight of lost family and friends. But Matthew, thank God, Matthew was not willing to do that. Instead, we read that he persisted. I bet he thought long and hard. I, I, I bet he prayed for wisdom and direction. And then it hit him. He'd throw a party. I mean, with, with music and, and, and great food. And his, his friends, they love parties. The bigger, the better. Now all he had to do was find some way to inject some sort of purpose into it. I mean, what to do, what to do. And then it hit him. He invited Jesus and his disciples to see if they would be willing to come and plant some spiritual seed in the hearts and lives of his buddies. You see, Matthew wasn't just content to throw a party. He was going to throw a Jesus party. You know that we don't have all the details, but what we do know is that the religious leaders got wind of Matthew's plan and they didn't like it one bit. Apparently, they thought he was doing evangelism the wrong way. It's interesting to me that they didn't say anything directly to Jesus about this. Instead, they go quietly to his disciples. I think they're probably trying to plant the seeds of doubt in the disciples' minds as to Jesus' character. I think they're trying to imply that, well, if he really was a godly man, he wouldn't be hanging around people like this. But friends, I want you to know that assumptions, they can be dangerous. In his book, 
Point Man. Steve Farrar tells the story of a photographer for a national magazine who's assigned to, to shoot a great forest fire out west. He was told that a small plane would be waiting for him to, to take him out over the fire. And, and as, he, as he arrived at the airstrip just before sundown, sure enough, there was a small Cessna waiting. He jumped in with his equipment and shouted, let's go. And so the pilot obediently swung the plane into the wind and, and they were soon airborne. I want you to fly over the north side of the fire, said the photographer, and, and make several low level passes. Why? asked the nervous pilot. Well, because I'm going to take pictures, retorted the photographer. I'm a, I'm a photographer, and photographers take pictures. After a long pause, the pilot replied, You mean you're not the instructor? <laughs> you, see, you see, assumptions really can be dangerous. The Pharisees we're assuming that religious and non-religious folks shouldn't mix. But I want you to know this morning, church, that those assumptions were wrong. Jesus spent all kinds of time with all kinds of different people. And the implication is that we should do likewise. Why, you might ask? Well, thankfully, we're told. It's because all kinds of people need Jesus. Verse 17 says, And on hearing this, Jesus said to them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. During this exchange with the Pharisees, I, I picture this freshly converted Matthew listening in and and wondering whether or not he'd done the right thing. After all, this was his first evangelistic effort, and, and now here was Jesus getting chewed out by the religious brass. I imagine him thinking, maybe I should have just dragged my friends to the temple. Or, or maybe I, I shouldn't have done anything at all. Now everybody's upset. Jesus is getting the third degree. I, I just, I better not take any more risk like this one. I'll leave evangelism to the professionals. But then, all of a sudden, he heard Jesus defending his actions. Jesus, in fact, commended Matthew's party idea by reminding the Pharisees that sick people are the ones who need a doctor. I mean, why would a physician waste his time with healthy people? In other words, unconventional approaches that strategically mix the spiritual haves with the spiritual have-nots, it's not only acceptable, it is essential if sick people are going to be made well. We don't know what happened next. But I can imagine Jesus turning and, and putting his arm around a shoulder of Matthew. Good job, Matt. I understand what you were trying to do. You were thinking about your buddies and their spiritual needs. You were willing to take a chance. And I want you to know, I'm proud of what you've done. I'm honored to be a part of your plan. Now, let's get back to the party. You know, if I'm right about any of that, then there are some simple principles that apply just as much today as they did back then. See, I think, first of all, that God's desire is for us to value unbelieving friends the same way Matthew did. And secondly, I also think that he would want us to be wary of, of using old, stale techniques for, for reaching those outside the family of God. Thirdly, at the same time, he certainly, he doesn't want us to, to wring our hands and give up. No, I think he would challenge us to do what Matthew did. 
I, I think he would challenge us to be creative and to be innovative, to, to come up with some sort of strategy, strategy that's true to who we are and that would work with our friends. I think we'd want us to pray hard and then to be willing to go out on a limb. You see, friends, if you want to get fruit, if you want to reach fruit, if you want to harvest fruit, you're going to have to be willing to go out on a limb because that's where the fruit is found. Beyond that, I, I think Jesus would want us to learn from our mistakes and then to adjust, to tweak our approach accordingly. Church, we've got to seize opportunities to rub shoulders with pre-Christians if we're ever to reach them. I think it would do us well to perhaps have the attitude of Officer Tori Matthews of the Southern California Humane Society. Uh, one afternoon, she got a, an emergency call. A, a boy's pet iguana had been scared up a tree by a neighbor's dog. After she arrived, Officer Matthews saw as that uh, iguana then fell from the tree into a sim swimming pool where it sank like a brick. Officer Matthews didn't give it a second thought. She dove into the pool and emerged shortly thereafter with that limp pet in hand, but it wasn't breathing. She later said that she thought, well, you can, you can do CPR on a dog and, and a person. Why not an iguana? And that's exactly what she did. She put her lips on those of that reptiles. Now looking back on it, she said it, it was a, a pretty ugly animal to kiss, but the last thing I wanted to do was to tell that little boy that his iguana had died. And eventually, you know, that iguana responded and recovered. The key to the whole story, I think, is that Officer Matthews didn't see some waterlogged reptile. She saw a boy's beloved pet, and she was going to do whatever she could to save it. Do you know, we may never really see the, the beauty in some people, but when we remember how important they are to God, friends, I think we need to be willing to do whatever we can to keep them from drowning. Even tax collectors. <laughs> this morning, can I challenge you? Don't just be hearers of the word. Be doers of the word. As I pray this morning, I'm going to ask you to ask God to give you a picture of a friend who you care about but who doesn't know Jesus. I'm asking that you would pray, as I pray, that God would give you wisdom to know how to present them with this life-saving truth. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word today. It has power, Lord, to guide and lead us. I'm praying for your people that you would use us to establish your kingdom, that God, it would grow as we are obedient to your word. And so use us, we pray. Use us to reach out in love to those that we know, to those who live near us, to those, God, who matter so, so very much to you. And so now, it's in Jesus' name that we ask all of these things. Amen. Well, God bless you. Thanks for joining us this morning. We trust we'll see you again next week.